and welcome to Desert Gardening News, a Star Nursery podcast. I am Joey Lynn, and today we are joined with Dr. Q from Dr. Q's House Calls, along with co-host Madeline, who is always here with me every week, and I love having her. And today we have a special guest. We have Professor M.L. Robinson in the house, and um, we will get to your introduction. But first, we're going to talk about real quick our Dr. Q's house calls. Um, For anybody who's joining us for the first time, we do a to your home consultation um, called Dr. Q's house calls. It is uh, for a small fee and we are there for up to an hour diagnosing plant health and lawns and trees and any kind of diagnostic questions you might have. Um, So if you're interested, you can find more information on our website or go into any Star Nursery location and purchase your house call in advance. But the reason that we're here today is to have Professor M.L. Robinson with us, and we're going to have a great day. Our topic today is going to be everything palm trees. Absolutely. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Professor M.L.? Well, thank you, Joey Lynn and Dr. Q, and it's really happy. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I started with palms. I grew up in Florida, and I work now and have for the last 40 years just about with extension in several states. Uh, My first recollections of extension was going and picking my grandmother up when I was about five or six years old with my grandfather at the extension homemakers club, uh, once a week. And, uh, of course I wanted to explore the uh, old schoolhouse next door looking for, uh, reptiles. And, uh, that was my main interest, not extension, but I've had the opportunity of growing up in Florida. I love palm trees. Uh, there are about 17, uh, species of palm trees to, uh, uh, Florida and the outlying islands there and uh, actually grew up eating some of them. Uh, s- some of my old family members, uh, they had what they called swamp cabbage and that's the sable palms, the heart of the palm. And sometimes you can uh, buy commercially produced from Central and South America, hearts of palm, and they make salads out. And those palms grow back, but the ones we ate did not. Um, And if you're having your Washingtonian cut down in your backyard, you can save the heart of it. It's very sweet. And I've eaten Washingtonians out here. I don't feel so bad about Washingtonians as I do other palms being (laughs) eaten. But uh, I have had a career in horticulture for most of my life. And I've worked uh, at universities in Utah, Hawaii, uh, of course, Florida, the University of Florida. And then I took a position about 26 years ago out here and brought my love of palms with me, along with adding to it uh, cacti and succulents and all the marvelous plants that we can grow here in the desert. Well, we are just so happy to have you. We are big fans. As a matter of fact, you are um, one of the professors that teach our uh, Nevada Nurseryman Certification Program that we're so proud of. And um, Dr. Q, Paul, you and ML have known each other for how long? Uh, it's been, what, 20, 25 years? Yeah, just like about that. when I got here, yeah, yes. Yeah, so we've... we've uh, We've known each other for quite a while, and uh, we get along okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're a lot of fun, and it, being in your class is just, it's always inspiring. I always enjoy um, learning from you. There, it, it's just such an entertaining, and your interests are so broad. You have so many interests, and it, life experience and travel, you love to travel, and you always are telling stories about bringing things back through TSA and how exciting that is. (laughs) My bags are always searched. (laughs) Well, okay. So, and how, so Dr. Q, how are you doing? How's everything going on with you? Any, any new exciting things in the horticulture world for you? Well, not much new and exciting, but, uh, managing to keep up on, on current, current events and, uh, and doing my best to help, uh, customers in yeah. the valley here with any uh problems they might have with their plant material yeah. or um or with irrigation which is becoming more and more yeah. uh 
uh, important. Yeah. Now, and now that we're into summer and the Dr. Q's house calls, irrigation is big, big, big topic and uh, planting people planting big trees right now and trying to keep them irrigated and alive. Yeah. In fact, I did just saw a thing in the paper just uh, yesterday about uh, how uh, the, the state wants to actually uh, plant a six what is it, 60,000 trees and focusing on more residential areas. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily because uh, they need something to offer more shade and coolness because of all the grass that's being eliminated with the heavy water use of grass. So so that's going to be a major project for the next, uh, probably next uh, three or four years, I'll be working on... uh, Uh, planting a lot of more trees in the urban areas. Well, you know, there's so many wonderful drought-tolerant trees, both native and from other desert areas that we should be using uh, rather than those that uh, take so much water to make them look fine. And so, uh, and that's been a problem that we've uh, seen uh, from the university standpoint. Housing developments are mandated to have at least one tree in the front yard, and that seems to. I was amazed when I moved here because that seemed to be the uh, landscape in most neighborhoods. You get one tree in the front yard, and it's done. And then half the time, those are dead within a few years because people don't take care of them, or they were the wrong choice, or all of the above. So, uh, we, like I said, we have wonderful trees. That I was just at a, a friend's house. Um, for uh, his uncle, who's also a good friend, and he was showing me his backyard, and he had so many uh, drought-tolerant trees in his backyard. Uh, we don't think about mesquite, but mesquite, uh, you plant the right varieties of mesquite, you can harvest the beans, and he makes his own flour. In Tucson, they have festivals of gathering up all the mesquite beans and grinding them. And of course, fig trees. I love fig trees, and you know, again, something that you can put water, use your water and fertilizer, and it gives you something good to eat at the same time. So I think we need to think drought tolerant, but can I eat it too? Absolutely. That's what um, Nevada plants. Uh, we have a good um, colleague in the industry, uh, Lisa Ortega, and that is, she's a arborist and she has her Nevada plants. And that's what she does is she goes in and she, um, where there's a urban food Island. Um, and what she does is she works hard to get grants and go in and plant trees that produce food, um, and helps the programs growing, Like you wouldn't believe. And that is exciting. Well, we could go on and talk about this forever, but this, but we do have a topic that we're going to do today and it's going to, um, but first to you, Madeline, right here, we're going to go into the news section. Yes. Yeah. We're, we have a different setup today, so we'll be passing the mic back and forth. Um, but yeah, before we get into the palms, it's funny that you brought up the fig trees because I just looked up fig trees and I didn't realize that there was controversy if it's considered vegan or not to eat a fig tree (laughs) or a fig. I didn't know that. And apparently there is some controversy where it's like, oh, the fig itself. Yeah, the the wasp that pollinates it because it is like consumed by the tree or the fruit itself. Well, it's part part of the pollination process. And but not all of figs, uh, the figs we grow here do not need to be pollinated by wasps. Oh, good to know. And um, but that was one of the first things you learned as a child in Florida. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, we grew a lot of guavas and others. And uh, you learn that the little uh, baby uh, fruit flies inside are kind of crunchy but they die right after you crunch them or when you cook them, they quit wiggling. So a great source of protein, (laughs) great source of protein. Delicious. It's the food of the future, actually. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Well, it's good to know all vegans in the desert Southwest are safe. You can enjoy your figs. Um, But yes, today we are going to get into our news portion of the show. Um, It's not palm related, but because ML, I know that you are a big fan of wildlife and insects and reptiles, just a big fan of it all. I thought that we could talk a little bit about um, what's 
been going on in the research world. So I found this article on sciencedaily.com. Um, and this research was done by the Florida Museum of Natural History um, just last month. So, uh, or not last month, two months ago in June. Um, so the study is the first of its kind. Um, and essentially they wanted to go over the weather anomalies that have been happening um, in turn with the climate change and just different anomalies like extreme weather. So extreme hot when it's not supposed to be, extreme cold when it's not supposed to be, or elongated times and how is that affecting insect populations. Um, and because I thought, you know, we, we're all a little insect savvy. What a great topic to talk about. So uh, we'll just get into it. So from a quote from the article, in the first study of its kind, researchers at the University of Florida used natural history specimens to show that unseasonably warm and cold days can prolong the active period of moths and butterflies by nearly a month. And what they found, they actually were not expecting. Um, because it's the first of its kind, they didn't know what to expect when analyzing these patterns. And going through the research was a little difficult because they had to, you know, go through different specimens from different museums and collections um, and analyze all those specimens. Um, and the specimens that they had hundreds of years old. So they were really able to get into this research. Um, and what they found was that unusually warm and cold weather has significantly altered insect activity to a greater extent than the average increase in global temperatures for the last several decades. So from the specimens going from the 40s to the 2010s, 2010s that they found, um, it says that uh, in higher latitudes, warm days in winter meant moths and butterflies became active earlier in the spring. Unusually cold days kept insects at all latitudes active longer, and the combination of exceptionally high and low temperatures had the strongest effect. Um, they found that insects can recover from the cold snaps pretty quickly and go on to have longer lifespans as a direct result of sudden temperature declines. Um, but the article does point out that altered insect lifespans may also mean more opportunities for pathogen transmission and that unusually warm or hot dry springs followed by heavy precipitation event are also linked with these sorts of outbreaks. Um, and the last point that I'll mention in this article is that if moths and butterflies take flight too early, they risk encountering plants that haven't yet produced leaves or flowers, expending their energy in a vain search of food. Um, and of course, as all Science Daily articles end, they go on to talk about how they, it's going to become more extreme weather patterns in the future. And at some point, the capacity to buffer against these changes is going to reach its limit. You know, very dire consequences, <laughs> it likes to say. All the Science Daily articles are like that. They are very apocalyptic at the end. But it brings up a great conversation because we have been ex experiencing different weather for sure different weather than we've experienced in the last 10 years um and that question arises is that how similar that this research that they did in the east coast how is that going to be similar to um what we might experience with insect populations here in the west coast in the desert southwest well uh, Who, <laughs> i i just like to say that i i think that that is dire. <laughs> We're all going to die. <laughs> but great optimism. Uh, great optimism. But there are things that we can do seriously. And and uh, we talked before the show, planting perennials and and plant material that may be. And of course, when when you look at uh, from a botany standpoint and a horticultural standpoint, uh, plants may be both. Uh, Lantana is a good example for. It's a, a perennial here, whereas in colder climates, uh, even in this state, uh, it's an annual. It's planted as an annual. And uh, so uh, planting of perennials that we talked about, I think that's really important. And we have a lot of uh, more drought tolerant. Looking at native plants, um, we disperse so many animals by our building out there, and that includes insects and, and whatnot. And it's... Uh, um, we need to plant more native types or those that are similar to natives uh, that will take the place for food, uh, pollen and nectar on there. So I, I think there are things that we can do. We can do uh, wise landscaping and, um, and, and, and work with uh, nurseries uh, 
that uh, can bring in material rather than um, from a local perspective, rather than a corporate large, uh, we're going to send you all these plants and they'll probably die after they get off the truck because they're not, you know, for here. Paul, you and I were talking uh, coincidentally just about this in the Italian Cyprus and the spider mites and what we're seeing because we're not getting cold enough that the populations are not naturally reducing. And by the time spring comes, these mites are already in full reproductive mode and they're doing a lot of damage. Talk a little bit about that, Paul. That yeah. Yeah, That's absolutely, because been... uh, I see that a lot in house calls. Uh, a lot of people having uh, spider mite damage on, especially Italian cypress, junipers of any kind, um, and also on a lot of other plants as well. See it on uh, grapevines. <laughs> uh, it's it's running rampant on the last uh, several calls I've had with people who have grapevines or uh, roses, uh, aphid or um, the mites are almost as plentiful as the aphids on roses. So, uh, and, and plus they're harder to detect when they're young. So by the time you do notice them, they're, they've already done a lot of damage to yeah. your plant. So, so yeah, that's something important that, uh, and a lot of it has to do with the climate. I mean, that it, it's uh, not necessarily the climate, but the times of the heat and cold extremes. And when we're seeing that, more and more now across the whole country, whether it be back east or whether it be out here. Uh, back east, especially this year, you see these extreme cold and extreme heat that they are not used to. And that's got to make a big difference in, um, you know, a lot of uh, the insect populations, a lot of the uh, pollinizers and, and a lot of vegetation as well. And it happens here with us as well. We are more, a little more effective in, are affected by the extreme heat because we get it for longer periods, which do a, a lot more damage to our plant material than uh, it would back in, in on the East Coast because they have the extreme heat usually for short, much shorter periods that don't do quite as much damage. But it is affecting us as well. Well, I think that we need to uh, also do a lot of observations. Uh, uh, one thing when Paul was talking was uh, hard to recognize. You can't see them as soon. But part of the reason for that is most people are not connected to their yards they or their plants. Look. They don't look. They don't enough. look. And it's like there's some of us that are out there talking to our plants. And my colleague uh, from New Mexico, you know, we go on a trip together and it can be midnight. He's out when we get back, he's out looking at his yard, checking on everything, make sure everything got water while we were gone and whatnot. And most people aren't like that. I always compare most people's landscapes to the furnishings in their house. The grass or mulch is like their carpeting. Uh, the plants are just pieces of furniture out there. They're not really living things and they don't pay any attention until they call us or they call you and say, my tree died overnight. No, no. it's been dying for a long time and you just haven't noticed. And I think we'll see more and more of that. And, and the insects will continue to uh, live longer. They will have more populations. You mentioned aphids. I love talking about aphids in class because those poor things, they're mostly females and they're born pregnant, a good portion of them. And so, so live, a, live a good life so you don't come back as a pregnant aphid. Yeah, right. Right. Well, I, I think also, and correct me if I'm wrong, this would also then move into things like bacterial issues, things that plants that we're hanging on to longer, like our tomatoes or our peppers that we're actually working to hang on to um, so that they have a longer, because I'm noticing this a lot with our tomatoes there. We're having, we had a late spring, so uh, there wasn't much fruit. And now we we've wet, got people a that wet spring too. And a, that, that did a lot to affect tomatoes. Absolutely. And now, well, 
you encourage the homeowner hang on to that plant protect it from the extreme wait for that fall harvest and then in turn they do that again to get through winter and all of these issues just keep building up in the soil nematodes and bacterial wilt and all these things right i mean yeah. it could be the same thing and same with uh powdery mildew or um i i guess it could cross all things not just insects right and and i think we'll continue to see uh, uh more and more of this and this is where um uh, good observation uh hopefully homeowners will observe and and communicate with uh your nursery and with our with the university and our master gardeners bring in things and of course we, we get calls like you guys do and that helps us stay up on it but um you know plants that have been out there for a long time may not survive and so we look at uh, something new. Uh, one of the trees that we just planted at the research uh, part of our botanical gardens out front and some of your students help plant uh, are mastic gums and I saw mastic gums in the Middle East and they grow under really hard conditions and uh, and people are surprised about the pine trees going down hill here and I'm thinking no, they looked this bad in Jordan. And I was driving around with the head of forestry for the country. I planted all these and I'm going, yeah, and they really look bad. <laughs> but they were under rainfall and uh, they weren't being irrigated where he had planted them. But they were trees from that part of the world and they still struggled out there. Not throughout the country, but in a lot of areas. And so um, we need to look at what are we going to replace these with? And uh, roses are a good example. We have a rose garden, but it's very small. Mm -hmm. And it and it's high intensity. It and is. And it is beautiful. And you're the amount of volunteers that you have that are dedicated to the Rose Garden. Um, anybody who hasn't been out there really should go and see. And the address is 8050 South Paradise yeah. Road, well, correct? Paradise. We always, I think it's just paradise. It's just paradise. And, um, or I'm it's, going to the wrong building. <laughs> no, but it's open to the public. Yes. Yes. Monday through Friday, eight to five. Oh, it's just a treat. The whole property is just a treat. And there's so much to learn. And you have your, um, variety of palms. What palms do you have on the property? We have about a hundred different varieties and species of palms and we're adding to that. Um, right now, I would encourage everyone to come out at, by the front gate as you drive in. Uh, I always consider myself nano, the Nanorops king and that means nothing to non-palm people, <laughs> but Nanorops is a wonderful desert palms. People don't think about palms as being desert plants. This one's from Afghanistan and Pakistan and any other stand you know, <laughs> uh, in, in that part of the world. Uh, there are blue forms and green forms and in between, but I have over five and I personally made this happen. Uh, five bloom spikes coming on uh, this one palm that I raised from a baby seedling. And uh, they don't bloom that often. There are some of these that are 50 plus years old, like in Vatican City and whatnot, because it's been cool. They have never bloomed. And uh, these bloom about every other year. And now they're starting because of weather change, I think is part of it. They are blooming. So I'll have lots of seed. I'm oh. trying to uh, get people to take them home and plant them. They're a beautiful palm. They're a clustering palm. They don't get 30 to 50 feet tall. They stay about 20 feet and multi-trunked. And some of them actually branch. And it's one of the few palms that branches. So Did you bring seeds with you today? No, but okay. I can get you plenty. Okay, there. I would like... <laughs> <laughs> and and they're fairly easy to grow this time of year. Um, uh, you just uh, what I do is put uh, six to ten in a one gallon pot, keep it moist and outside where it's hot. And by you get into fall and you'll have some babies. And by next spring you can plant them out. And they're just wonderful palms. And we have so many wonderful palms that we should be growing here, that we're not because they're more expensive. And uh, you, they're hard to find. 
Well, and the reason for that uh, is just because people are not that familiar with them. Yeah. And because they're not, a lot of the uh, producers, growers in nurseries are not going to be growing them until people start asking more for them. And and they're not going to ask for them until, until they, they, see them. they see them and learn about them more. And, you know, because, this is... Uh, public knowledge, but the city of Las Vegas, I think, is stopping putting palms on any of their plants, their future plants. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Is that I correct? Not, I did not know that. A lot of homeowner associations have already done that, and some parts of the, of the valley are restricting the amount of palms. And I think mostly that is because of a long-term warning that some palms bring bring in into town different uh uh things like scorpions and, <laughs> and things like that it, and and that's just uh it's just not that true anymore well uh, and 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 the thing is that we still have building materials that come in and scorpions came in right. on yeah. building materials that came in on other potted plants and whatnot. Uh, I don't know who, and, and you s came up with this concept, but um, it's been here longer than I have. And Jeff Knight, the state uh, entomologist, has shown that the bark scorpion was here before mm. uh, palm trees came into the valley in nurseries and whatnot. But uh, you're right, there, there are um, communities. Uh, but if you, again, one thing I stress in my classes, as you drive around, and this is what I do, I drive around the community and I learn everywhere I go. And those who have taken my classes know I'm a garage sailor. And uh, it gets me into the communities. I find great bargains. That's the main goal. That's I'm not a hunter. I don't like going out, the idea of killing animals or anything, but I like a killer good deal. And so while I'm out there, I get all these great pictures of what's going on in the landscape. I just took a picture. We're talking about fig trees. This massive fig tree in front of this one-story house shading the whole side of the house. So what do they have? They have wonderful shade in the summertime. They have sun coming through in the wintertime and fruit. That's sweet. And I learned that this Italian, um, basically, I was one of the few non-Italians at this birthday party, uh, that not only should you put black olives and uh, anchovies on a pizza like I like, but figs with a little bit of honey. And oh, I thought, wow, that sounds good to me. That sounds <laughs> really good. And uh, so you, you have the best of all worlds. Yeah. The other thing I do is... When you see an abandoned house or office building or whatever, what is still alive? And most of the time, what is it? Most of the time, it's Washingtonians, yeah. palm, trees. palm trees, and they survive long uh, after pine trees and, and others there. I'm not a big Washingtonian uh, fan because they are beautiful, the tall ones, the Mexican ones, but they get too tall. They cost you a lot of money, I know. I had four in my backyard that cost me a fortune. I didn't want to take them out, but I had no choice. Uh, and uh, But, you know, there's so many others. Berjea Armada, the beautiful mm. blue Mexican. It doesn't get as big, and that's available in the nursery. Sables, sometimes you see sables, even in the big box stores. They'll get them in probably by mistake. Uh, but sable, there are sables that are... Um, native to the desert southwest in Mexico that do well here. There's Sable Minor, which we have by the classrooms, that after 50 years, they'll have a, a, a trunk that's only a foot tall. So you can use it as a foundation planting. Well, I think that that's a good point in what you're saying is that each palm brings different characters. It, right. It's got a, a different height, width, everything. Going back to why a city would choose not to, from my understanding of what I've learned, it's they're considered water, high water need for a small return in canopy coverage. Tell me how you feel about that comment. Well, I, th I think that um, 
you know, people are always saying that they always have these excuses. In New Mexico, they don't want to plant palms because it'll make them look like California. To which Jeff says, you plant pine trees, you don't mind looking like Colorado. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, they, they don't do a lot of shade unless you plant them in clusters and, or groups. And or, or you choose the right variety that correct. does have a the, bit larger canopy. Larger canopy. And, you know, Washingtonian... Um, Robustas are beautiful from the 515 in particular as you look out over the landscape. Of course, it's kind of hard to see the houses that they're growing around, but they're sticking up in the air and they're very nice and great pictures that you can take with no houses in the way or anything. But Paul is absolutely correct. Pick the right ones and put them in. Uh, and it, it you have to choose according to your landscape and make wise choices. I love Phoenix canariensis, the uh, Canary Island uh, date palm. Great palm, unless you have a little house and a yeah. little lot and a, and a four foot trunk with eight to 10 inch spines on it. Not so good. And, and people do that. I have yeah. a picture in my class of a 10 foot by four or five foot, no, 20 foot by uh, 10 foot medium strip where they had over uh, 14 Phoenix canariensis. Oh. Two would barely fit in there, and then they had other palms, uh, and that was a pro supposedly a professional landscape. I mean, mm. uh, a thirty to forty foot palm tree with a four foot trunk is not a good ground cover. No, <laughs> no. Well, let's let's get into that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the proper placement of palms. Um, so let's start with the big one. Let's talk, uh, talk with the Canary Island and the minimum required space needed for this palm. Yeah, I would want a, a root area at least 10 feet by 10 feet. And where do we find them? We find them between a wall and a swimming pool. Absolutely. And palm, palm, palm roots will not get any bigger than your finger, mm -hmm. but the root ball will expand and expand. And that root ball can easily go three to five feet from the trunk mm -hmm. over its lifespan. It'll send out roots wherever there's water and nutrients and whatnot. But that expanding root ball can heave walls and, and, and what sidewalks and whatnot, because it's just a mass of roots. It's not, a, you know, if you have an oak tree, and you, uh, the root grows under a sidewalk. The root grows and grows and expands. Palm roots don't, but the the uh, amount of roots may expand underneath. So you, you just have to use common sense. I hate to use that word because it's not very common, but you have to look at it from a logical and a botanical aspect. Mm -hmm. The biology of the I, palm and what it's going to do. Yes, Paul. I fully agree with you. The common sense thing, though, is so important because most of the problems that people have and the solutions for them are just common sense. And, but people don't look at that. They don't look at the fact that you know, palms have a huge matted root system that can actually put more pressure on a wall than a uh, uh, woody ornamental plant that has the large, uh, you know, branch style roots with the little feeder roots yeah. of, uh, coming off of it. Uh, those bigger roots can put a lot of pressure, but a palm, if it's close enough to a sidewalk or a pool decking or wall, it's going to put so much pressure on it, it's, it's going to be hard to stop the damage yeah. that it's going to do. Well, and one thing you have to remember, back to this simple concept, where do roots grow, right? In class, I always say that, and there are three places where there's moisture, nutrients, and oxygen. Mm -hmm. And I, in class, I have a wonderful picture of uh, somebody – um, I, I know they didn't do it intentionally for me on a Saturday night, ran into a, a cement wall around the subdivision and broke the outside wall off. And there inside, lo and behold, they planted a palm tree right next to the wall and it was full of palm roots growing up the wall inside right, of the wall. right inside the wall. Why? Because they were overwatering and the wall was staying moist inside the roots were right there and they go, well, there must be some food in here. I can breathe and there's moisture. And, and I'm going, I'm sorry for the guy who ran into the wall, <laughs> but what a fabulous picture for class. And uh, 
So, so we have to keep that in mind too, that, you know, plant in the right spot. Not only do you want to keep your sprinklers away from the wall, but you want to uh, also keep anything that's going to expand. And, and we put, and, and you know, my, my palm trees that cost me thousands of dollars to have cut down were so cute. Yeah. I probably bought them at Star Nursery. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good name. But they were so cute when I got yeah. here. And then I pulled them up in, in where they were invasive. And, uh, and, and how they were long cheap. do you think it took for them to grow to where you needed to have them removed? About 20 years. Yeah. Which 20 they, years happens pretty quickly. <laughs> well, and they grow like two to three feet a year mm-hmm. if you're irrigating them. Yeah. But on the. get water. Yeah, water is the important thing, and and they're not over water users. You can put them on. I've seen uh, there's going to California. There was some type of water resort area out there, and they had date palms that for years survived without any irrigation. Yeah. And and I see that in uh, parking lots, uh, especially those in in um, commercial areas that are managed out of state and. You know, if they don't call you, the they call me or both. And uh, you go in and uh, they haven't done anything. Uh, and they said, well, when was the last time you put, checked the irrigation system? I don't know. And some of them have collapsed by then, but they've gone years without yeah. any irrigation. And so we can um, wean them off and a, a, a mature day palm can use about the same amount of water as a, um, uh, a uh, 700 square foot uh, piece of turf. And yeah, so let's talk about irrigation. Well, one, oh, one, go one ahead. other comment I wanted to add, because uh, ML touched on it, is that uh, um, the palms, actually you can control their growth rate very well by how much you water. I mean, like like you said, they can go long periods without water and sustain, but they will grow much faster the more water they get. And I that's especially true of like the Canary Island date yeah. palm. I mean, they will survive well with very, very little water, but if you if they have water available to them, they can grow very very rapidly and wow. get big real real quickly. A lot of our desert adapted plants are like that, the mesquites and whatnot. And one of the survival, and again, you have to look at it from their standpoint, you know, you have to think like the palm. (laughs) And for a lot of people, that's probably a little difficult and they've never, (laughs) that concept, but palms have a a survival technique and they will set many palms. Uh, Sables are a good example. I, uh, I brought some sables with me and I left some at my mother's and my mother's, they were in sandy soil with rainfall only half the year and, um, no nutrients, uh, to say, and they didn't grow. Their overall height was shorter than me. And then the ones I brought with me, same group. And I planted in my backyard. They're fairly tall now. Uh, but you know, within that period of time that the others didn't grow in Florida, you think, well, there's the ideal spot. Uh, the ones in my backyard with minimum care, I had uh, five, six foot of trunk uh, within just a few years time. And so uh, they will set there. I had a uh, Livestonus chinensis that stayed between mom's two buildings where it got enough water and after seven or eight years, it was still this tall. It was still alive, mm-hmm. and but it didn't have the nutrients and a constant water supply. So uh, we can control things. And, and, and then we're always worrying about water, which we should be, but how many people use organic mulch? Palms prefer organic mulch. And, and we uh, uh, still uh, uh, don't know how much longer, but at the research center on Horse and De- North Decatur, uh, give out free recycled yard waste uh, mulch, and that builds up the soil. Or you can go to your local nursery and buy mulch. That's a lot easier. Not everyone wants to go fill their own bags and whatnot, and just us cheap people. <laughs> and uh, and you build the soil and you help uh, save water because um, you know two percent. Organic matter in the soil will save you 50% or more on water Mm -hmm. and it'll make the plants healthy and happy. Well, when we talk about water and we talk about palms, a little 
drip irrigation system with a couple two gallon per hour emitters. <laughs> and somebody <laughs> says, oh, my water's been off for a week. They're really not accomplishing anything for a palm tree with that water anyway, correct? They're not accomplishing anything. that amount with any Anything, plant. exactly. So when we think about proper irrigation for palm trees, why don't you touch on that? They give the proper approach that if you're going to be successful and have a successful long life of a palm tree, it, what is the best approach for ir- irrigation for them? Well, I, I just uh, tell people to do it the same with any other uh, tree or plant. You want to water at least out to the drip line, and that's not as far on palms, but uh, and then good organic uh, mulch. I like to have, make sure when you're designing your irrigation system that you can expand it. Uh, usually uh, people true, design it. True for any plant. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's the thing with palms. Uh, when I'm teaching the class, which I just did uh, last week, I'll say how to choose the correct palm, but you can apply that to any other tree or plant. Mm-hmm. How to water, how to fertilize, it, it, they're, they're all very similar. And um, some take more water, some take less, whether it's a palm or others. But you want to be able to move that irrigation out so you keep the root ball moist and encourage roots going out the more roots you have out the more stable the tree is whether it's a palm or others and uh you know we have very shallow soils here so we need a good root system and then um fertilize you don't want to over fertilize i recommend between one uh to three times but usually once is going to be enough if you have a good organic soil and uh, i'll go years sometimes we because I get busy, and even the ones at the office, they'll get uh, uh, an addition of uh, mulch, organic mulch. But we are going to fertilize this year. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still in good condition. So uh, they're 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 not, you know, the um, uh, little uh, plant that you have to treat. You know, when orchids first came out, and then on TV they, oh. Here, Dr. Q, here's your orchid, and you have to have a humidifier, and you have to have this, and which might be true out here. And, and you've got to, you know, it was this thing that you have to baby. Well, there's some babying taking place, depending on where you live with orchids, but um, they're pretty hardy. I grew them in Florida, and they grew on trees, and, you know, they like the high humidity. That's true, but uh, a lot of plants are really tough, and palms are and that's why we have Washingtonians everywhere because they are really tough. But if you want a Washingtonian, plant a California or a hybrid Washingtonian. Which they, most of the most of the palms in town here are hybrids. But yeah, uh, and it's because of the way that the growers grow them in the same fields and they cross pollinate. Uh, but also another thing, and as far as irrigation on them, is I tell a lot of the customers that that I see and ask about it is that, you know, that the way that the, the growers actually irrigate the fields where they're grown is they flood the entire fields with about a foot of water, maybe two or three times a year. That's it. And that's all the water that they get. But yet they, they grow those things for business and they seem to do fine with the amount of water that they get. But it's critical just to make sure that that you have the right soil. Uh, a lot of people think that, you know, palms have to have sandy soil. They like good drainage, but the organic matter is going to help any plants, any plants survive better. And also in fertilizing, the organic matter breaks down in the soil and actually gives them nutrients that will give them enough to survive even without a lot of other commercial fertilizers. Yeah, so like but, our palm courtyard that we haven't fertilized in a while. <laughs> right. But it's going to help. You know, yeah. With- no, no. I mean, it, it does. And I, I concur that, you know, we need to be on a better fertilizer schedule. But the palms aren't growing 
rapidly so that we don't have uh, over, overgrowth, over, over, yeah. overgrowth on it. And, and our, our palm courtyard is, I think, very beautiful. I like to see a day when we Absolutely. have weddings in there and whatnot. But and, and then on the outside. But you touched on sandy soils are great for palms, but they drain quickly. And so you have to water more often. Uh, organic soils are really the way to go. And uh, in the urban area, I might not flood or water twice a year, but uh, you, we overwater most things. Yes. Even turf is overwatered, and that's one of the reasons it gets a bad name is that people water it or they don't prepare. You know, um, I've seen turf where you go in the backyard and they go, it's not doing too well, and you pull it up and yeah, it, it's it never separates. rooted in. Separates and, from the soil. And so, uh, but watering is important and we need to conserve water, but I think we can get away with a lot less. And again, be observant. You can wean your palms or any other plants often as much water as you're putting on. And uh, my front yard has a lot of palms and other plants. It looks more like Florida than here. But I usually turn my irrigation off and just hand water what needs to be out there in the wintertime. Uh, have I a know lot my better success with a lot of the uh, uh, landscapes around town if people would use that advice. You know, we recommend it for cactus and succulents, but a lot of the drought tolerant desert adaptive plants are do just fine with minimal uh, irrigation in the in the winter cool months because the water that you do give it is going to stay in the soil longer and it's going to be used less because the plants don't have to absorb all that so fast to cool themselves off because of the cooler weather. Well, and and uh, especially cacti and succulents and anything like similar to that, um, depending on the drainage, you can rot the plants yes, off. easily. And so, we again, we have to go back and observe and see what, you know, uh, what does well where. And, you know, you look at a desert willow and... I have pictures of them and Palo Verde's growing in cracks by medium strips yeah. that there's no irrigation. They get a little extra mm -hmm. water harvest. Um, there are, uh, at one time, um, I'm trying to think the exit on 15 going to the strip, there were Palo Verde's that were fairly large size growing out of the cracks of the cement yeah. uh, side. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, I would encourage if you think palms are not drought tolerant while you're driving down I-15 in the middle of town uh, on both sides of the medium, which is nothing but a, a cement barrier, there are palms, live mm -hmm. palms growing that came up on their own. No irrigation there. I don't know where they get the rain, the, the water. It's certainly very little rainfall. And uh, they don't grow very fast. No. But they're sitting there, and every once in a while, DOT will come along and go, oh, look, there's palms that have been there for five years. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe we need to cut them down. But, uh, again, that what a great lesson. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to think of myself as being a pretty good teacher, but those poor little palms sticking out of I-15 are a better teacher on irrigation and the hardiness of palms and one in particular anyway not Absolutely. so good of an indication of where they should be planted no <laughs> yeah they don't really know where there's a... <laughs> and, and, and just for the record i didn't throw any seeds there, there you go those birds those birds right. doing and a little wind, germination on wind. their own well i have some friends in dallas that they they are urban gorilla palm planters and they will throw <laughs> seeds when they're out. If, if there's a landscape that's really looking ugly and and whatnot, the, the, they carry palm seeds with them and they'll throw them in. And the first time we visited them, they took us on a tour and they, we'd go to this restaurant. And he said, see those tall oh palms? Some of them have died in the freezes now. Those Washingtonians, we planted those when Jim and I first met. And, you know, and, and see these along this... Uh, uh, median strip. We planted babies. They get more rainfall. <laughs> we planted the babies uh, along there because there was nothing in the medium strip. And so um, I did not do that, though. <laughs> Johnny Palm Cedar. Yes. <laughs> there, there are people that love palms even more than I do. 
Well, our next topic I think is really important is to talk about the need for fertilizer. What do you think about fertilizing and what things can we look for that's going to um, let us know that our palm trees need fertilizer? Well, uh, first thing is to pick a palm fertilizer, good palm fertilizer, and something with a ratio of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the three main numbers that they seem to be more and more hiding somewhere on the bag rather than the front, uh, which is very frustrating for the, us that are used to seeing it right on the front always. But you want a 3-1-3 ratio or something similar to that of the nitrogen 3, phosphorus 1, and potassium uh, 3. And then you want the micronutrients because frizzle top can be a problem. Uh, yellowing on the older leaves of uh, date palms can be a problem. And so you want the uh, micro and macro nutrients that are complete in a palm fertilizer. That's really essential. And if you do that with organic material, as we've talked about, that's that's probably the most important thing. And one of the reasons that it's always good to maybe do one fertilizing uh, in the um, late spring, early summer, like May or June is usually what I recommend. If your soil is 70 degrees or better, uh, the roots are active for most palms. And uh, put it, I like a good granular. I, uh, I would suggest that you put it on and water it in really well, hand water it. Don't turn your sprinklers on to run everything else but just hand water it in and then put a good layer of organic mulch. And palms respond very well to chelated iron, correct? But it's a temperature thing for the chelated iron and palms as well. Yes. Well, well it's, it's the temperature is that the roots are going to be more active at 70 or higher. Uh, If you're putting on a chelated iron for an iron deficiency, you can always spray it on the leaves. Talk and, uh, about that. We don't typically talk a lot about foliar sprays. Uh, we, because of our customers and how convenient it is to put down, just broadcast something into the soil. But talk a little bit about doing a, a foliar spray on a palm tree. Well, uh, I would only do it if it was a, an extreme frizzle top or iron deficiency or something like that. The the, the tree is really suffering and, and it might succumb. They can succumb. We don't have frizzle top here that I haven't seen like we do in Florida and other areas. Right. Of it's the country, not, not real common here, but uh, you know, uh, it's a chelated iron spray is good unless you have lawn furniture and a, <laughs> and walls and and various other things that you're going to get it on, and then then you might want to put a liquid uh, fertilization on the ground and water it in, but that's a quick fix. <laughs> Yeah, you I'm don't. sorry. I could just picture rust color, the, just the all red, kinds red of staining just iron. coming yeah, all the way. Anytime down. you get it on concrete or oh yeah, the concrete sh- sidewalks, yeah. <laughs> slow so, moving children and so foliar pets. <laughs> foliar feeding though isn't bad if you've got extreme problems, but right. but there's a couple of reasons why I don't recommend it a, a lot is that one because you really shouldn't apply it in hot, really hot mm-hmm. temperatures. Uh, two, um, the the application will, in most yards, they're so close to other plants and things that you may not want to to get those products on. So I really think that the uh, either liquid or granular, uh, either liquid drenching or the granular applications are better. Well, I think you hit on a really good topic that we should have, we, me, uh, <laughs> should have hit on is that because yards are small and plants are close together, uh, unless you're seeing an extreme uh, problem with, um, you know, deficiencies in your palms or others, if you're fertilizing, you still have turf and you're fertilizing that, or you're fertilizing your other landscape plants that the palms are mixed in, you know, we, we say, uh, you know, don't fertilize, don't, don't pl- um, use turf fertilizer any closer than say 10 feet or so to palms. Well, in our condition, that's hard to get away from. So your palms may be getting enough fertilizer, mm. uh, and but just watch for deficiencies from the lawn and shrub 
fertilizations if you're doing that with a good granular. And ML isn't it important too, uh, as far as palms in particular, that the fertilizer does have a little bit more magnesium and manganese yeah, yeah, than, yeah. than other fertilizers. Yeah, typically absolutely. Have. Yeah, and that's included in the micro the palm, macro right. palm fertilizer. That's why I always say, you know, you're going to get nutrients from the shrubs and and trees and other fertilizations. But you're absolutely right. That's why they really need maybe once a year a good palm fertilizer. You know, you can use, if you can read a label, you can use fertilizers. It's not like a pesticide that says you can only use this on a pine tree, but you can't use it on an apple tree. But um, in this case, I, I remember one time I had a lady look over the fence in Florida and I was fertilizing my Gerber daisies uh, with um, rose fertilizer. And she goes, you're using rose fertilizer on, on your Gerber daisy. And I said, don't they look good? And she said, yes, but I said, you know, they don't <laughs> mind. And what I wanted to say was somebody had given me the rose fertilizer and it was free and, <laughs> and Gerber's didn't mind. But uh, if you can read the label, understand it. And, and in the case of palms, uh, Paul is absolutely correct. You need to have that particular um, uh, fertilizer for them, for the for those nutrients. Now, if you could find another fertilizer, they had the three one three similar ratio with all the macro and micro in it. That would be fine. It wouldn't matter. But palms are specific on that, and palms take less nitrogen. Most of them, mm -hmm. queen palms, we should not grow here. Queen palms, uh, the best queen palms I've ever seen were in the Mirage Hotel inside in the atrium, in the atrium. <laughs> and then they grew so well they had to take them out uh I, and i'm not sure if they replaced them or not but um they they take more uh nitrogen and majesty palms which i lost one of my majesty and right next to it uh the one in the um uh, pond filter bed it's it made it through winter just fine so climate change is a reality but they take more um um, nitrogen and so there are some that will take more but most of them don't want a lot of nitrogen you want that nitrogen and potassium to be as close to even as possible there's an inner relationship there very true and uh actually we've probably and i don't know if you've already got this but we should probably give customers in the area a little bit more information about which palms really do the best here and uh the different varieties other than the common ones that you see here that can be used yes and, and have a, even better results than the ones that we have growing now and we handed that out last week to class all uh, right there, there's a publication you can get it online 50 palms that uh should be grown or should be at least tried in our area I probably need to update it, but it, it has a good uh, listing of palms. And that, that publication is uh, available where? Uh, on uh, the UNR uh, extension uh, website. Extension website. I'll All right. Link right now. Okay. Lots, <laughs> lots of great, <laughs> lots of great information on that website. Yeah, and and that's a good point that you brought up. There's also um, a publication by one of my famous favorite authors, me, uh, <laughs> that uh, on uh, uh, a monthly schedule for date palms, fertilization, pruning, and whatnot, but you can apply it to other palms. And then there's a 30-page book or booklet on uh, growing date palms in the Southwest. And so there's a lot of good information. And again, it's about date palms, but it talks about water use and the critical months of uh, when uh, the most water needs to be used in the least and, and uh, with, with some facts and figures that have been figured out on it. But it's pretty simple. It's like anything else. Summertime, it's hot. They need water. Wintertime, not so much as we talked about. And, and, and also on the fertilizer, um, which we just talked about, is that palms are one of the few things that really need or their fertilizer in the hot months. Yes. In the warm months, like, uh, like I'm all said, temperatures, soil temperatures need to be set at least 70 degrees. So 
um, in the hot months where we want to stay away from high nitrogen fertilizers, especially during the hot weather on most plants, palms are the one exception, big exception that that's when they need their fertilizer. Right. As long as the nitrogen is too right. high. But you bring up an excellent point on um, them. Uh, as far as fertilizing, we, we have to look at everything as a holistic aspect. And uh, when you're looking at um, fertilizer, and then you go in and you prune off all these leaves. And one of my pet peeves, and my students know this, and sometimes they don't use it, but in, I don't believe in plant food. You can walk into any garden center or big box store and they talk about plant food. Plant food is made by photosynthesis. We buy fertilizer, which is nutrients. I know it's a pet peeve and I'm grasping at straws here, but we add... The fertilizer is a basic uh, nutrient that they make their own food. How do they make their own food? With green leaves. What do we do? We come in and we prune just about every leaf off. And Washingtonians, again, we're back to Washingtonians. They're not really evil, but they, they survive that. I see them top them and they grow back up. And uh, if they don't top them 18 inches to two feet below the heart bud, the heart bud yes. But... Um, you know, we we want them to grow our palms, and then we over prune them, mm -hmm. and and they're not able to make their food. And research has shown that in a healthy palm, there should be approximately the same number of green leaves on the outside as baby embryonic leaves on the inside, and they're helping feed the new leaves coming out and the new leaves inside. And so palms don't stir store food as well as other plant material because they're always growing. And then you have to know, uh, I had a, a windmill palm at the office, trachea carpus, that had green leaves all the way down to the base until a well-meaning volunteer pruned them up because there were leaves all the way down. And we know palms only have them at the top. And I was leaving it there for class to see how long it took before any they started uh, dying off. And each palm has a set number mm -hmm. of leaves that they can hold on to and uh, green. And again, we need to be able to observe. I've counted on young Washingtonians uh, in commercial plantings that they hadn't gotten around to pruning all the leaves off. Um, these were under probably 10 or 15 feet, 60 green leaves on them. And I have a boring life, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for a friend to come out of this store, and I thought, oh, look at those Washingtonians with all those green leaves almost to the bottom. I'm going to go count them and see what the average number is. <laughs> but other than my poor social life, I learned a lot about palms. <laughs> Have to be interested enough to learn anything. Thing. Yes. That's right. Well, and touch on a little bit about why you did about the nutrients and, and why we need to hang on to the fronds. But also over pruning makes the palm susceptible to disease and insects. and Right. And, and especially because uh, if you're pruning green leaves off and you're not sterilizing from one palm to another, as you should, if you're pruning, you should be using alcohol or, um, you know, the peroxide or, or various Lysol or things. Uh, disinfectants. I, some type of disinfectant. I don't, um, uh, you know, there's some that are more corrosive like um, chlorine and, you know, bleach and whatnot. Or use a reciprocating saw, which only cuts on one side and you don't nick the other uh, leaves that you're not trying to. But if you prune dead leaves off, you have a very uh, small chance of spreading disease. Whereas living tissue, uh, you can get uh, the, both the sawdust and the um, other contaminants on the saw blades. And so uh, with the... Uh, um, Fresarium will and canariensis uh, in California, they are very um, uh, strict. The the good uh, arborists uh, that know what they're doing, they they only use uh, 
one or if they need more than one blade on each palm tree and then they some of them actually have the customer sign off that they left these blades and that the, they were used on different palm trees so that if someone comes in and says oh you have for cerium they're not going to be responsible for these you know ten thousand dollar palm trees that have become infected and uh, but we need to keep that in mind and you know if a palm frond or a bunch of them are blocking your doorway. You plant it in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. And most of the time we have to over prune stuff uh, for safety reasons because it's in the wrong spot. It's by the front door. It's blocking a stop sign. You know, it's next to a plate glass window. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, um, you know, again, palms are just beautiful. If you let them grow, they should have this nice oval effect of live leaves, not look like a feather duster sticking up in the air. Mm -hmm. And, and you look at, well, one of our popular ones here is the Mediterranean yeah. fan palm and Shamarops humulus means shrub like, and they make great barriers and they uh, great hedges and, and whatnot. And what do we do? We prune them up so they have little tops. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, but that's why we're having the conversation is to make people aware. Uh, we do a lot of house calls where they go, oh, I'm new to Las Vegas. I've come from the Midwest and I hire the same guy that my neighbor does and they all hire the same. And the guys come in and they prune and they go, oh, well, I didn't know it wasn't supposed to be like that because I see them like yeah. that all throughout. So it is important that we have these oh, conversations. Yeah. Absolutely. And that, and that's, that's part of the problem. And one of the reasons we try to do as much commercial education, because they take the commercial people teach each other, whether it's right or wrong. And then it's not that they're bad people. Mm -mm. It's what they've learned and from each other rather than taking classes on it or reading research we do have arbors out there that are good and know what they're doing um but uh you know and then the homeowner sees it and says well i want mine to look like that or the head of the homeowner association says they have to be all pruned off because we don't want to pay them to come more than once a year correct exactly and that's uh, the big, big biggest excuse i think is because of the uh amount they have to pay to get them trimmed yes and then we go back to that's why you don't choose certain palm trees know what your future is in that property and what your expectations and what you plan on spending and and what is reasonable for you making those decisions uh, at the beginning, if you can, can't always do that because you're moving into a home that already has the existing right. um, situation. So now the I want to ask you personally your opinion on skinning and diamond cutting palm trees. OK, well, I like most things have an opinion on it. Uh, I don't like skinning. Anecdotal uh, information has shown uh, mostly in the Southeast and in Florida that palms with what we call boots backies, the, the bottom of the patio, which is what they skin off, uh, has an insulation effect for both cold and heat. Uh, with Washingtonians, we're back to the Washingtonians, about 15 to 20 years into their life cycle, they'll begin dropping those boots on their own. And I suppose, I haven't read any literature on it, that maybe that's the point where they don't need the insulation anymore. Uh, I don't like the skinning because uh, of the fact that it helps uh, people say, well, the scorpions can climb them easier. I've gotten... Uh, scorpions out of offices on the third floor. They can climb stairs. They can climb stucco walls. Uh, that's no reason for it. Uh, they they want it to look more tropical. It's an aesthetic thing for uh, some people. I know that in in wetter areas, ferns and whatnot will grow in those boots, and they're quite decorative. Some people don't like it. Some do. Diamond cutting, I think, is a little different in that, uh, again, it's an aesthetic aspect, but uh, a good portion of the fiber is still there as an insulation. So I don't have a problem. I think it's a, 
uh, uh, an expense that I wouldn't pay for, but I'm cheap. So, uh, <laughs> but I like my palms, but it, it, it depends. A lot of it has to do with where you live. And this, again, you're, you're making extra waste to go to the landfill. And I might be more susceptible to saying, okay, if you're grinding that up to make mulch and or add organic material, uh, and palms can be a little more difficult to grind and, and, and chip up, but uh, it goes back to the aesthetics. But it, it, again, it's how we look at things. I, I had a queen palm, and I do have some queen palms on property. Uh, they're in a sheltered area and whatnot, but I had a queen palm that fell over partway. And so I said, well, good, because in Florida, a lot of times people will buy palms and they'll lean them so they get that curved look. Mm -hmm. like hurricane a, palms. Yeah, hurricane out here, but yeah. uh, <laughs> they look more like a coconut or more tropical. And um, the landscape crew would come in and straighten it up and I'd cut the, <laughs> the straps off and lay it back down. I finally had to put a sign both in English and Spanish that said basically, please leave this alone. It's all right if a palm leans. Mm -hmm. And But a lot of people, and in this town, I think you see them, nice straight rows of, of palms. And if you go out to China Ranch, they have some beautiful 100-year-old date palms that have curved trunks. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a difference between it going phototropic versus a drought. Yes. Palms that have been in extended period of droughts will get a curve in them. And right. then once they get their water back, will yeah. then become more erect. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm thinking more of the correct, but the, they also shrink their trunk mm -hmm. and that tells you they haven't had enough fertilizer. They haven't had enough water. And you're absolutely right mm -hmm. on that. And then that can cause a problem because uh, this narrow neck uh, can be, um, although they're overly uh, structured, there's always the potential of that being Breakage, a weak point, a failure, yeah. a weak spot. But palms are o uh, overly constructed and uh, mechanically, and so that's why they can bend and have mm -hmm. the hurricane palms at the uh, uh, Treasure Island and mm -hmm. and whatnot. And California grows a lot of them. They'll just tip them over and let them curve to. And and, and it's a beautiful look. If yeah. you want to have a tropical look, have have a little bit of curve on it. It's, One it's thing that so I did want to mention about skinning, though, is the only time that I kind of can see why you might want to do it is when those boots start flaking off oh, in yeah, the heavy absolutely. winds. And so then you get that real kind of ugly looking. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I agree that that 15 to 20 year period when they start to fall off in winds, right. then I would come in and take off the space in between because yeah. they don't always do according to how old the boots are they they may yeah. come off here and here and you have these bare spots and whatnot and, and i agree i but it does aesthetic. get dangerous when they're and it's also around on the yeah. Wind. Yeah. yes Absolutely. and with the canary island the mistake people make is thinking that they're to create that pineapple look and so they over prune them uh, to think that they're creating that big pineapple top. And that is absolutely incorrect. Yeah. And how the the growth of that pineapple top does not raise as the palm tree gets taller. So you can't create it and it stick that yeah. way because as the palm you, you grows, have to continue. <laughs> you'd have to, continue. have to keep doing yeah. it. And, and uh, I've seen them in California where they haven't pruned any of it, just let them yeah. go up. And then eventually the boots fall like mm -hmm. on the Washingtonians. I, I had uh, a colleague from um, uh, university that was f from Mexico and he had a client at the end of the Baja in Cabo. And we found someone here to go because someone who had a, uh, a vacation home down there had seen the pineapple look here and they wanted that down there. And there was no one, no one did it down there. And because they hadn't seen it, I guess being done and no one thought it was of any importance, but, um, yeah, I remember the first time I'd never heard of them as pineapple palms. My first job, uh, I was about 20 and in a nursery at Ace Hardware and some newly planted 
person in Florida came in and said, we want a pineapple palm. And I then gave him a lecture. I wasn't even a professor then. <laughs> I gave him a lecture on that pineapples are bromeliads and that's where they come from. And, and he goes, can we talk to someone who knows anything? <laughs> <laughs> Little and it, did and they if know. he said Phoenix canariensis, I would have known exactly what. Oh, <laughs> they don't well, grow pineapples. <laughs> yeah. Now removing the fruit um, because of the sheer labor of it, getting to it early is completely fine in yes. a palm tree. Yeah, and, and I recommend that, especially in uh, date palms. Most of the date palms that come into town are females. Uh, they're not going to put on a fruit that you can eat unless you're hand pollinating them. And in commercial sites, they don't. Now, if they sometimes can get pollinated if you have Phoenix canariensis or other Phoenix palms in the neighborhood, because any uh, uh, date palm, whether it's the true date or, or Phoenix canariensis as a, or even the pygmy date, the pollen will work on any of them. In fact, some of the commercial places are now using canariensis pollen, whatever pollen they can get. So you don't always know whether the seed will come true. But uh, on Washingtonians, again, uh, date palms, uh, even if they're not pollinated, they'll drop the fruit and it's messy and it also attracts rodents. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want that. Uh, I recommend that you go in and uh, with a hand saw or a reciprocating saw, reach in, don't take all the leaves up because those are the older leaves feeding and reach in and take the inflorescence, the flower stalk out as soon as it's fully extended. I would wait until it starts to drop, ideally um, the petals, because then you know that the pollinators have gotten the nectar and the pollen out of there. I have a sable and I missed it. Uh, every morning for about a week, I'd go out and it was, um, oh, um, just covered in pollinators, not just honeybees, but mm -hmm. all kinds of native pollinators going in there. Whether they were pollinating doesn't matter. They were getting the nectar and the pollen uh, to use as food. But go in and take those out. The only one I wouldn't do that I have uh, just a great love for, if you have a healthy Brahea armada, that thing is a beautiful flowering mm -hmm. tree with yeah. the bloom spikes coming mm -hmm. out and cascading down. And um, uh, I, I'd leave that until it finishes blooming for sure. Well, thank you so much, ML, for your expertise on palms. We're going to wrap it up with our final portion, our little pop quiz, um, where we're going to ask, ask the experts what they know and see if they can answer these questions. They're not hard uh, questions. They might be. Who knows? <laughs> uh -oh. we've, we've, they, they've stumped me before. Yeah, we have, we have <laughs> been able to stump the experts. Okay, but hopefully not. So this first question is palm related. So we've got our chances okay. pretty high. So which species? of palm can grow to be 14 star stories tall, making it the tallest palm species. Oh, I'm trying to, species or genus, the wax palms are the, the tallest growing and they'll go up to 200 feet. Yes, you are correct. The Quindio wax palm, which is the national tree of Colombia. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. that is the tallest palm tree. 14 stories tall is crazy. Crazy, so crazy. All right, question and, number and two. And can I interject? Oh yeah, of course. The, those types of palms, the really tall ones, are the forest palms that are, are in the upper canopy of forest. Just a little trivia there. Love it. <laughs> um, number two, can plants detect detect touch? I would say yes. I mean, there are certain plants that uh, will actually respond to touch by folding up, or uh, but I think that any plants most likely can uh, distinguish probably because of the, um, just because of the cells well, inside the leaves. We, we're learning now that there's a lot more uh, that we know the trees can communicate with their right. roots. Uh, there's, there's something on, on line that, there's a group that are doing, they started with mushrooms, of course, but other plants where they put probes in them and uh, there's a synthesizing of sound. Biodata sonification. Yes. I actually just purchased a synthesizer to do that. 
So I just purchased purchased a device, (laughs) and our social media will be getting more and more videos of different plant species responding to. Will you send me where you got that? I'd love to have that for class. Oh, it's so much fun! I literally, it's in my car right now. I take it with me everywhere. And even if you don't own the device, the app itself has broadcast so other people with the device you can listen to their live streams kind of and it's just live plant music so yeah. it's really fun i think it'd be great for cl- was it expensive it, it was okay. <laughs> it was pretty expensive. i'll find a grant for it <laughs> you can She's build looking for a reimbursement grant you can <laughs> you can build your own if you're at all tech savvy and with a breadboard you can you you know wield it all together but because i'm not I just bought it pre-made, but you could build your own for like $50. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Dr. Q, you are 100% correct. So plants can detect touch. And a study that was conducted and confirmed through Washington State University of May of this year, um, it shows that humans and animals sense touch through sensory cells. Um, the mechanism in plants, it appears to be via the increase or decrease of internal cell pressure. Cell pressure. Yeah, and right. it doesn't need some sort of nervous system in order to detect the sense. Like we rely on our nerves in order to detect the sense. So they can but detect it in any cells. It's any of the cells and on the surface. Yeah, that, that can do this, which is really cool. So we really can be tree huggers and it make a Absolutely. difference. Yeah. Oh, my my plants tell me they love me all the time. <laughs> there is also <laughs> confirmation um, that they did find through that biodata sonification uh, with the plants like Venus flytrap and that um, the plant that closes up on itself. It's like dicot that, you know, that like yeah, holds the, up uh, when you touch it's it. A, it's, isn't it like a little l- mimosa? It's yes, yeah, the, yeah, mimosa, the mimosa, yeah. And um, sensitive they've plant. actually yeah, sensitive plant. confirmed that these plants can count count and that with in the sense of the venus flytrap it can count a s- certain seconds in between a fly you know or pressure within its like mouth its trap part mm-hmm. and um, if it doesn't sense pressure within that for a certain amount of time then it won't close or it won't or it will close and mm. that's just like it's counting like oh is there a fly in there is there not a fly so really great research that we could get into on a different date but some fun facts okay um (laughs) we'll move on to the next question um true or false the word bug is a casual term that actually means insect well that's what most people think it is is it true i i think that I I I remember reading somewhere that um, that the term bug is generally used for oh, yeah. but I think that actually bug is is a part of the insect group but it's like cactus and succulents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like You are correct. It's yeah. like uh, su- all yeah, cactus, the cactus are succulents. Are succulents yeah, but exactly. not all not succulents, all succulents yeah. or cactus. I was going to contribute and feel important like I was as smart as you guys, but you got it all out before I could get the mic in front of my mouth. Yeah, <laughs> you, you guys are correct. Yeah, and see, I'm, I'm trying sorry, to think of where stupid. it came from so originally. all bugs are insects. Not all insects are bugs. bugs. Um, but under the technical definition, uh, true bugs belong oh, to okay, an yeah. order of insects called Hemeptera. Or yes. I'm, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Um, and then insects are a class in the phylum Arthropoda, which also includes arachnids like spiders, myriapods like centipedes, and crustaceans like crawfish. Insects, along with all arthropods, have the segmented legs and hard outer layers called exoskeletons. But bugs have are they're more categorized by their straw-shaped mouth or stylet. Um, that they use to either They're sap juice sucking, from plants. Sucking, yeah, sucking. yeah, those those like, like needles that yeah. they put in there. Yeah, so mosquitoes. And th- those would be the true bugs. Not yeah. all of them like fall under this category, but um, most of them do. So it might be confusing confusing for somebody um, that sees a, a ladybug or a June bug because they're not technical bugs. bugs. Those okay. would be insects. Well, versus if they've got like pinchers or chewers. They're they're not really bugs. Yeah, bugs so we're only sucking insects. Is that correct? And yeah, the insects yeah. Well, it would goes be... back to the true bug and yeah. and yeah. and the the general. I, I'm thinking, where did the general term of bug come from? And as always, I'm overthinking everything. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but but, but you, you're absolutely right. The true bug. Is, yeah. 
So that's just some fun oh. misconception of the terminology. So you bring etymology into entomology and <laughs> you can combine them and learn something new. Uh, but that's all we have today. I think that was such a great opportunity for us all to learn from a local expert. Um, and we're definitely going to be linking some of that literature that you mentioned um, so that everyone has the opportunity to dive into palm trees or dive into some local species of bugs as well. But other than that, is there anything that you'd like to um, tell our listeners about or any fun programs that have been going on at the extension? Well, our, probably the most exciting thing is that we've completed our uh, three small uh, houses, we call them. They're tough sheds, and they're landscaped uh, in three different types of landscaping for this area. One is extreme drought, uh, and it has a rock mulch, and uh, but not just the boring one color and, and very drought tolerant that we won't um, be watering obviously as much as the other two houses. The other two houses have an edible landscape and a seasonal all year color landscape, meaning that there will be flowers and, and color throughout the, the, the uh, seasons of the year. And then the edible one is, you know, if you're gonna spend time, money and fertilizer out in the yard, let's eat it. Let's get something back. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, and if you like grazing, I guess grass is all right, but I'd rather have a fig tree. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, ML. For our listeners, if you'd like to be more involved with Star Nursery and everything that we have going on, you can follow our socials. We are on Instagram at Star Nursery LV, uh, Facebook at Star Nursery, um, and as well as Twitter at Star Nursery. And if you're watching us on YouTube right now, you'd know that we are Star Nursery Dr. Q on YouTube. Uh, well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here and contributing to this episode. Is there anything else that you all would like to add? No, thank you all very much. And, and visit the extension on 8050 Paradise Road, right off in 215 by the Harry Reid Airport. Well, with that, we will say goodbye, and we'll see you all next month. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.